Again, let's come before God with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Draw near to us once more, living God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we heard the first 10 verses of the Psalm 116. We actually just sang a hymn that's based on the same psalm. Here are the remaining verses to the end of the psalm. And it says this, What shall I return to the Lord for all God's bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation. I will call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people. For precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant, I am your servant, the child of your serving maid. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. I will praise the Lord. Friends, this is the word of God. Thanks be to God. All right, we're not quite in the season of Christmas, but think about your favorite Christmas carols. I would wager that almost every carol that comes to mind is actually one that's in a major key if you look at it in the hymn book. Silent Night, B-flat major. The First Noel, Joy to the World, both in D major. Go tell it on the mountain, hark the herald angels sing, O little town of Bethlehem, all of them in F major. There's really only one commonly sung carol that's in a minor key, and that's the carol, What Child Is This?, we heard in E minor. As I mentioned, it's those opening notes of that carol that are built around a minor chord and that in and of themselves evoke a very special and unique impression. What child is this? who lay to rest on Mary's lap, is sleeping. The carol immediately calls to mind the picture of vulnerability, of solitude, if not aloneness, a young mother and a child, quiet, alone, in a rude stable, in a world that has not graciously welcomed them in all of their need. That opening minor third tells us that the story we're about to sing about will not unfold with angel voices and loud shouts of joy, but rather will come to us as an honest acknowledgement that life is not always easy. Government power would have forced Mary and Joseph that long ride from Nazareth to Bethlehem. The childbirth was going to happen far away from Mary's midwives and women helpers. And poverty and a bed of straw are all that are going to welcome the child as it emerges on that dark Christmas Eve. Now, it's true even in this carol that once the child is identified, this, this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing. At that part of the carol, the song moves to a major key, a tone of celebration. But quickly the song returns back to minor to E minor, this reflective quality that's best suited for naming our own limitations and laments and our fears. Life isn't always easy. Those words could practically be the slogan of the last 18 months. I mean, yes, we're back in the sanctuary, and yes, the choir is back in the chancel with the brass roots. Yes, we are holding in our hands again familiar bulletins and hymnals, and children and adults alike, yes, are once more gathering for Sunday school. But even as we gather, we are keeping our distance. We are wearing our masks. We're unsure how to navigate life in this minor key season. Many of you are back in your familiar pews. I recognize you. But many of you are are watching this service remotely, watching from home. 
And even as we celebrate another fall rally day in our church, we lament that over the past months, more than a year, we were not able to gather here for funerals or weddings. We haven't been traveling. We haven't been visiting family members. We haven't attended reunions. We haven't been going to concerts or movies or plays. And as we reflect and look beyond the walls of this sanctuary to our world, there's much to lament over these past months. A divisive election and a literal insurrection in Washington. A soul-rending season of racial injustice shaped primarily around the murder of George Floyd. The recent months and months of wildfires and hurricanes and floods. The natural disasters from Haiti to Europe and Asia and a painfully flawed withdrawal from Afghanistan. All of it, if not at least much of it, feels like life lived in a minor key. There have been moments of beauty. There have been moments of C major happiness and peace. But overall, it's been a long season of minor third faith, of loss and lament. Now, in the book of Psalms, there are psalms of lament and there are psalms of thanksgiving. A psalm of lament is designed for the author to name concerns that are weighing heavy on the person's chest, to lift those up to God that God might hear, where a psalm of thanksgiving acknowledges there have been trouble, but then goes quickly to say, but God has heard my prayer and brought me safely through this season of struggle. Psalm 116 is officially a psalm of thanksgiving. Early on, it names that pain has been endured. The poet describes literally being caught in the snares of death, in the grips of hell, causing deep anguish and distress. And it leads the psalmist to literally cry out, O Lord, save my life, I pray. But that wasn't how the psalm began. Its opening words were actually this. I love the Lord who has heard my voice, whose ear has been inclined to me. Isaac Watts paraphrased those words in the hymn that we just finished singing, where the first verse said, I love the Lord who heard my cry and pitied my every groan. Long as I live and troubles rise, I'll hasten to God's throne. Now, you and the choir, you sang that hymn beautifully, but if you really want to hear a good version of it, go online and listen to Whitney Houston sing it from the movie The Preacher's Wife. But anyway, in a time of trouble, the psalmist, the hymn writer, remind us that we are called to hasten to God's throne, to pray to God. But how do you pray to God during the minor key seasons of our life? Well, you pray honestly. You name what is on your heart as best you can. You acknowledge you may be going through the valley of the shadow of death. You may be literally facing the challenge of physical death or spiritual and emotional death. Addiction tempted, financial insecurity, vocation unhappiness, or simply just exhausted in body and soul. You name your situation for God openly. And if you can't put it into words, then it's always appropriate to simply sit before God and to open yourself up to God's Spirit in silence. The theologian Eugene Peterson has said that prayer is the joining of realities, making a live connection between the place where we find ourselves and the God who is finding us. God wants that connection. Psalm 116, the second verse says, God inclined God's ear to me. Imagine that. God desires to actually draw near, to listen to comfort us like a mother comforting a child on her lap. And in many ways, that's the perfect posture for prayer, to imagine being held, 
of a God inclining God's ear, of words spoken from our heart, whether with tears or heavy sighs, yet through it all, hastening to a place with a trust that God hears, God acts, God loves. Now that may not be easy to do in the hard moments of life. It's not easy to do when we look around us and we see in the world lingering injustice and inequity, when we see disaster and divisiveness, when we see COVID and other calamities. But know that when you pray to God, it is all right to lament. It's all right to name what is weighing you down. But I would have you also hold on to the wisdom of people like Russell Ellis. Russell Ellis is an 86-year-old man living in Berkeley, California. He's a, an academic, an African-American gentleman who was a track star, an architecture professor, a vice chancellor, and more recently, he was an 86-year-old man who decided to record an album of 11 original songs that he wrote. Now, this sort of late-in-life creative gesture got the attention of the local media, and so they interviewed him. And he was asked, well, Mr. Ellis, what do you wish you'd known about life when you were younger? And he paused for a moment, and then he said, life is shorter than you think and longer than you think. Consider that for a moment. Life is shorter than you think. Our time on earth is precious and short. We're not to take our days for granted. So do what you love now and tell those that you love that you love them now because life is short. But also take a breath and remember, life is longer than you think. A lot can be done in a day or a week or a year. Russ Ellis, he ran track, he mastered architecture, he led a university, he painted pictures, he carved stones, and yes, he recorded his own album of original songs. As he put it, I'm happy to have used my time in so many different ways, ways that have connected me to the world and to other people. Now, none of his accomplishments erase the troubles and the losses that he endured in his own life. But by taking the long view of life, it led him to make music and to laugh with friends and to find peace in the world. Psalms of thanksgiving, like Psalm 116, name the lament, but then encourage us to take the long view that names God as the one who hears our prayer and who holds us safe for whatever the journey has ahead of us. Verses 5 to 7 say, Gracious and merciful is God, when I was brought low, God save me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. There will be seasons of lament and loss. I cannot deny that. But we bring those things to God in prayer, in humility, knowing, knowing that our God inclines an ear, holds us safe, will never leave or forsake us. And in that promise, we move from lament to hope. Because life is always longer than you think. So now back to where we started. There was a richness captured in that simple Christmas carol in a minor key shaped around the minor third interval. The carol does not gloss over the difficulties of those days of Roman oppression and King Herod's jealous rage of a child born to a young girl and a nervous husband in a backwater town. But in the same way, the songs of our lives shouldn't gloss over the hard times, the feelings of lament and loss. We too carry scars. We too have known struggle and rejection. We too have prayed, O oh Lord, save my life. But lament is just one song on the album of your life. And the rich orchestration of a long life lived is something that's been intentionally composed orchestrated by
by a God who chooses to use minor and major keys, chooses to imbue us with spirits of expectancy and hope, and chooses to offer a love that we can always trust. Do not wish away the minor third intervals in your life. Lament is part of who we are. But in the end, lament gives way to trust and hope. And that's where the psalm takes us. Hear it once more. What shall I return to the Lord for all God's goodness to me? I will call on the name of the Lord. I will lift up the cup of salvation. I will pay my vows to the Lord. I will offer up my thanksgiving in the presence of God's people in the courts of the Most High. I will praise the Lord. Amen.